Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm going to be going over Unit 2 Microeconomics of IB Economics HL 2022 brand new syllabus. I'm going to be using this syllabus guide and going over all the understandings, the assessment objectives and the diagrams. As always, if you guys do enjoy my content and find it helpful in your revision, please don't forget to smash that like button. Let's try to reach 5 likes in this video. 5 likes would be awesome on this video. Without any further ado, let's get started with um, microeconomics. Microeconomics is all to do with individual markets and when we look at markets the most important things are the market forces which are called supply and demand. First let's have a look at demand. Here the understanding has us to learn the relationship between price and quantity demanded. Demand is from the consumer's point of view. I define demand as the ability and willingness of consumers to purchase a given quantity of a product at every given price. So we're looking at quantity demanded, which is how much of a product is demanded in the market. And we call this market demand. And the other type of demand is individual demand. Individual demand means an individual consumer demands a certain amount of a product. Say you as an individual demander in the shoe industry, you would demand, let's say, two pairs of shoes every year, whereas the entire market may be two million shoes. There'll be millions, a million or some, some number of people who collectively demand two million shoes per year. Now, what we have is something called the law of demand, which is the relationship between price and quantity demanded. The law of demand states that ceteris paribus, which means all things equal, as the price of a product increases, the quantity demanded of that product decreases and vice versa. So you can think of it this way, if the price of shoes increases, what happens to you as a consumer? You're less likely to spend money on shoes, right? You're more likely to think, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend or buy two shoes now, I might buy only one. So similarly, you have quantity demanded falling as price increases. At a price level of $50 per pair of shoes, there might be 2 million, 2 million pairs of shoes quantity demanded, but quantity demanded may decrease to 1 million if the price is increased to $75. That's how the law of demand works. Whereas if a fall in price occurs, maybe from $50, $25, there may now be $4 million of shoes demanded. So quantity demanded may be $4 million. Now, you may ask yourself why. And if you're a HL student, go for it. Why is important. If you're an SL student, it's not so important, but I still recommend understanding why. It helps in your analysis. When we have the law of demand, we have these assumptions called the income and substitution effects and the law of diminishing marginal utility. Now, the income effect is to do with the idea that as the price of a product increases, the amount of income you spend on that product goes up. So that means with your real income, you can purchase fewer amounts of shoes. Think about it this way. If you get paid $1,000 a week and each shoe costs $100, each shoe pair costs $100, you can buy 10 shoes. Whereas if it costs two, $200 per pair, you can only buy five. So as the price of a product increases, the proportion of income it consumes it increases. And as such, the quantity demanded falls. This is the same. This is um, the opposite effect when you have a decrease in price. Now, the substitution effect is about substitute goods you can get instead of that particular good we're looking at. So instead of shoes, we could look at flip-flops. So maybe if the price of shoes, inc shoes increases, then consumers, you as a consumer, are more likely to switch to uh, switch to flip flops, and you you might demand you might demand more flip flops and demand less less shoes, and as a result, quantity demanded of shoes falls as price increases, and when price of shoes decreases, you as a flip flop consumer may actually join the shoe market, and you might demand shoes. So quantity demanded of shoes will increase. The important thing to realize here, the substitution effect is there are substitutes, but you're always looking at the point of view of the good you looked at in the first place. So with shoes, that's the good we're looking at. We're looking at it from that perspective. The law of diminishing marginal utility states that as more and more units of a good or service are consumed, the extra satisfaction or utility gained from each additional unit falls. So that means as we consume more of something, we get less extra satisfaction. So think of eating a slice of pizza. There are eight slices of pizza. If you eat the first slice, you might get 50 utils of satisfaction. Second slice, you might get 40. Third slice, you could get 20. Fourth slice, you could get 10. In the fifth slice, you could get no utils. And in sixth, you could get negative utils. 
So it's all about your utility or satisfaction falling. And that's the idea that consumers won't actually spend, won't actually demand that many pairs of shoes because when they buy the second, third, fourth, fifth pair, they may have low utility. And consumers, they demand a product or demand a product based on the utility they gain. So if they gain more utility from it, they are likely to pay a higher price. Similarly, because of the law of diminishing marginal utility, they won't buy extra units unless the price also falls. That's why you have all these discounts like buy one, get one half price. Because the second pair of shoes would give you less utils, you are less likely to buy that second pair or demand that second pair unless price falls. So if price falls, that price fall matches your decreased um, utility, your decreased marginal utility, so you're more likely to demand an extra pair. So that's, and if price increases, you're less likely to um, have that extra unit, um, extra unit of shoes that you buy have utility that matches the price. So you're not going to demand that extra unit. So you're going to have a fall in quantity demanded. This is quite hard to explain and it deserves its general whole video, in fact, I guess. Um, but as I'm doing this for revision purposes, we have to rush through it quite fast. Next up, we have the demand curve. Demand curve is your bread and butter in economics. You should be able to draw it whenever and you have to apply it a lot in your economic study in IB. So on this axis, the Y axis, we have price. In economics, we have the independent variable on the Y axis. And here we have quantity. And as price increases, quantity decreases. So if we are, and as price decreases, quantity increases. So from this point to this point, price decreases, quantity increases. This point to this point, price increases, quantity decreases. Quantity demanded decreases. That's the demand curve. Relationship between individual's consumer demand and market demand. We already mentioned that, how an individual's consumer demand is added up. Every individual's consumer demand is added up um, to get market demand. So every individual in a market has their individual demand accounted for. The non-price determinants of demand. As the name suggests, they're not price factors that affect demand. And notice how here it says demand, whereas here it says quantity demanded. They're two different things. If you have a movement from, let's say, this point to this point, quantity demanded has increased, right? That's We say quantity demanded has increased because we're on the same demand curve. However, if you have this entire curve shift, right? So that means at every price level, there's more demand. That that time, we, then that instance, we say more demand because when the whole entire curve shifts, that means at every given price level, consumers are able and willing to purchase more, more, um, more shoes in this circumstance. Then we get a supply, we get a demand curve shift. And then we call it an increase in demand. Similarly, this is a decrease in demand. And from this point to here, that's a decrease in quantity demanded. Now, income. If income increases, that means that if you look at the income effect, right, that means there's a lower proportion of income that's taken in um, by the purchase of a particular product. So what happens is more product is going to be demanded and demand in the economy is going to increase. Similarly, taste and preferences, what you like. If something is trendy, then quantity demand, uh, not quantity demanded, demand is likely to increase. Think about fidget spinners. Remember how they were so popular and afterwards they just completely flopped, right? Demand would have decreased the taste and preferences worsen towards fidget spinners. Future price expectations, if you expect something to go up in price, you're going to want to take um, advantage of the pr lower prices now. So you're going to be more able and willing to buy now. So quantity demanded, I mean demand, sorry, is going to increase in the present. I don't actually mess up quantity demand and demand that much, but right now talking fast, it is getting a bit confusing. Not confusing, but just getting mixed up. But don't do that in an exam when you're writing. Price of related goods. Related goods are goods such as substitutes and complements. Substitutes are goods that are that can be bought instead of each other. Complements are goods that are bought together. So sugar, uh, so tea and coffee are substitutes, but sugar and tea are complements, right? Because sugar and tea go hand in hand. You can think about like bread and butter, right? They go hand in hand versus substitutes. You can have tea versus sugar, with uh, tea versus coffee, right? Because one person may prefer coffee, but the substitute they could have instead is tea. So the price of tea goes up, right? That means fewer consumers are going to be um, uh, demanding tea, so the quantity demand is going to fall, right? 
quantity demand of falling in tea means that consumers are going to switch to the coffee market because coffee, assuming Severus Paribus, where coffee hasn't changed in price at all, is now more appealing, relatively more appealing than tea. So demand in the coffee market is going to increase. Similarly, if you have a fall in price of coffee, that means coffee is relatively cheaper than tea. And give, if you assume Severus Paribus, where there's no change in the price of tea, then tea uh, demanders are going to uh, reduce their quantity demanded of tea switch to the coffee market, increasing demand for coffee. Number of consumers, as you know, that individual consumer demand is added up to, to get market demand. If we have more consumers, that means more market demand will result. So higher number of consumers, shift the demand curve to the right, lower number shifts to the left. And notice how I did not mention um, all the uh, ways the demand curve can shift for each of these factors. I want you to think about it yourself and think about which direction they would shift. Like when I said how the price of coffee increases or decreases, I want you to think about which way they would shift and do that by yourself. Pause the video, have a go, and I'm gonna continue the video. All right, assuming you did it, we're gonna continue along. Uh, movements along the demand curve and shifts to the demand curve, we already showed that. So that's to do with changes in quantity demand versus changes in demand. The law of supply. Now, supply is the ability and willingness of suppliers in a market or producers in a market to uh, produce a given quantity of a particular product at every given price. In price, and that's um, going to relate to the law of supply, which says the ceteris paribus. As the price of a product increases, the quantity supplied of that product also increases, and vice versa. Vice versa, meaning that if the price of the product decreases, then the quantity supplied will also decrease. Now think about it, you're a supplier. You're someone who produces something in the market. You produce shoes. If the price of shoes goes up, that means you can make more revenue, right? You can make more money from the shoes. So you're going to, you as a business, you want to make more money. So you're going to be, um, you're going to be producing more shoes. The quantity supplied will increase. And remember, we say quantity here before the supplied, not just supply, because it's a price change. When we have a price change, we move along the same curve. Before we go into these, let's look at the supply curve. So supply curve, um, we have the same axis as the demand curve. So we got price here. I'm going to write P and then Q for quantity. And as price increases, quantity, quantity supplied increases. So we have an upward sloping supply curve. We can call that S. Now, the assumptions of the supply curve are kind of like the explanations, like we have the um, assumptions of the demand curve, and the first one is law of diminishing marginal returns. Now, law of diminishing marginal returns is kind of a concept that we apply in theory of firm, which is a bit later on in our study, but um, what it is is that as more units of variable factor are employed to a set of given, um, set of given fixed factor, the additional um, output, additional output derived from each additional unit of variable factor decreases. So that means if you have um, a pizza shop, let's say you're Domino's, right, and you've hired three workers, let's say you hire a fourth worker, they may bring in ten more pizzas every day, and if you add another fifth worker, they may bring only five more additional workers because they. Are, so when you have that lack of workers, you initially when you increase the number of workers, you're going to have an increase in output that's greater than when you go from five uh, to six uh, or seven to eight or to nine to ten more workers. So the so the increase in output of pizzas when you go from three to four workers is going to be greater than when you go from five to ten workers, from nine to ten workers. You can think about it in the real world. There's more of a lack of e efficiency, right? Whereas when you get ten workers in the shop, they might get in the way of each other. There's no there's not that much room for them to, there's no, not much work to do for them. Some of them will be lying around. There may be all the jobs, or all the work that needs to be done in the pizza joint is done. And what, what law of diminishing marginal returns means is that when you apply more variable factor or when you increase the amount of factors of production you employ, um, what happens is each unit you increase by, the amount of um, increased output actually falls. So the amount by which you increase output falls. Like I said, instead of gaining 10 pizzas with the fifth worker, you may only gain five pizzas with the sixth worker. And suppliers, they only produce if they can, um, they can cover their marginal costs, right? The reason I um, sort of stumbled on the marginal returns explanation is because you really have to link it to marginal costs. Marginal cost is the cost of producing an additional unit. 
Okay, that's a really simple idea. When you produce an additional unit of pizza, it might cost you $2, right? As a pizza supplier. Now, the supply curve is sometimes called the marginal cost curve. And again, if you are revising economics um, after you study the entire syllabus, you'll understand that. But firms, they only supply um, an extra unit or they produce an extra unit only if they can cover their marginal cost. You can think about it this way. Would you produce shoes if it costs you more um, to produce the shoe than you can sell it by? Of course not. That's um, That goes against logic, right? So as price increases, suppliers can cover their marginal costs more. And with the law of diminishing marginal returns, you have to increase your output. If you want to increase your output by the same amount and keep going, you're eventually going to have to um, increase your cost by more. Because like I said earlier, if you employ that fifth worker, they bring 10 pizzas. That's 10 extra pizzas for an extra worker. But when you bring that sixth worker, you only get five additional pizzas. That all, that's only five more pizzas for one additional worker. So the cost maybe cost of hiring maybe twenty dollars an hour. Now for for five for ten pizzas you pay twenty dollars an hour. That's two dollars per pizza. Um, but now you paid another twenty dollars with the sixth worker for five pizzas. So that's four dollars per extra pizza. So see how the marginal cost has increased. So when you when you have um, more output being produced, marginal cost cost begins to rise. So well, you need higher prices in order to cover the marginal cost of suppliers. And when you get those higher prices, what happens is suppliers will supply a greater quantity of a product because they can cover their marginal cost. So again, these two concepts can be quite difficult to understand. So I'll probably make another video on it. But if you guys are revising, you guys should be able to follow um, supply curve. I'll put sloping, we already covered that. Assessment objective four, because you can get asked uh, basically paper ones, uh, paper one part A, part B on supply curve in microeconomics. Relationship between individual producer supply and market supply. So in the market for pizzas, an individual producer supply would be a Domino's down in wherever, like your local Domino's, whereas the market could be your entire city's pizza, which would consider like... um. Pizza Hut and other pizza dealers. Non price determinants of supply, as you might guess, shifts the supply curve, changes in cost of factors of production. So, if fact, cost of factors of production increase, that means at every given price, um, suppliers are going to be able and willing to produce less because, as, as you know, if, you, if it costs you more to make shoes, you're probably going to produce less shoes at every given price. You may get uh, you may be selling shoes at the same price of $50, but if it costs you more, let's say from $30 to $40, you're going to produce fewer shoes. So supply actually decreases. So this is a decrease in supply, uh, whereas from this point to this point, that's a decrease in quantity supply. Price of related goods. Now, again, like you had substitute and um, complementary goods, you have joint and competitive supply. So joint supply are things that are supplied together, like leather and milk because you have cows producing both maybe leather and beef and competitive supply could be rice and rice and corn right because you use the same crop but you you produce something in place of the other you can't produce rice and corn that's on the same crop right you give up one for the other so if the price of leather goes up then the, that means that people would supply or increase the quantity supplied of leather leather so so farmers would be producing more leather um, and quantity supplied would increase. That means at the same time, because the joint supply, the quantity, um, not the quantities, the entire supply of beef would also increase because more cows are going to be killed for the leather and beef. And in, in terms of competitive supply, if the price of rice increases, then farmers are going to switch to rice, increase the quantity demanded of rice. I mean, quantity supplied of rice, and what happens is the supply of corn decreases. Indirect taxes and subsidies. If there's a tax that actually um, that that's implemented that cost produces more, so that counts as an extra cost of production. So what happens is increased taxes shift supply left, or decreases supply, decreased taxation um, shifts supply right, increases supply. Whereas a subsidy is a payment made by the government to firms. And what happens is if you get a subsidy, it's basically lowering your cost of production. If you get $10 subsidy per shoe um, by the government, that means your shoes, you, you effectively cover 
ten dollars of your cost of production. So you'll have you have you essentially have cheaper cost of production. You get supply to increase. If you have a reductment of a subsidy, you have supply curve shift left or decrease. Future price expectations. If you expect the price of a product to increase in future, let's say you expect uh, expect shoes to increase in price, you're not going to be supplying as much now. You're going to supply them later. You're going to save your stock. Whereas if you expect prices to fall, you want to sell everything now, right? So you're going to sell everything out. You're going to increase supply. Changes in technology. Technology is to do with how efficiently you can produce and when you think about it, technology generally makes things um, easier to produce and costs decrease. So if you have an improvement in technology, supply curve shifts to the right, increases. If you have a um, decrease in quality of technology, supply decreases. Number of firms, again, based on the relationship between individual producer supply, market supply, you can get increase in number of firms, you get more, con more supply at each price level, so supply increases. If you have fewer number of firms, supply decreases. So again, we mentioned this, and um, one thing that's common maybe is in a paper three, you might be asked a full marker on the difference between an increase in quantity uh, supplied and an increase in supply um, as a full marker. And you guys need to be able to explain that one's a shift in a curve, one's movement on the curve. Demand and supply curves for market equilibrium. So market equilibrium is where quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. I'm going to draw a new diagram. So we're going to combine the demand and supply diagram. So we have price, quantity, and de supply demand. So S, D, this is the point of equilibrium. We label that simple E. And we can call this quantity Q, E1. And the reason I said E1 is because that, that equilibrium may not be the only equilibrium. I'll get to that later. That's P, E1. Shifting demand and supply produces new market equilibrium with reference to excess demand, shortage, excess supply. Okay, and what this is talking about is when you have equilibrium, you can have this equilibrium, right? Equilibrium is something that's harmonious. You're going to have supply and demand equal each other, but that's not always the case. If you have an increase in demand, let's say, let's say taste and preferences for shoes change in its favor, you're going to have this shift then at that current price level the quantity demanded we say quantity demanded because it's with reference to price is going to be over here it's going to call it q2 right but quantity supply is going to be qe1 so quantity demanded exceeds quantity supplied i call that qd greater than qs we call that a shortage right so you can think about it as the toilet paper shortage everyone was demanding toilet paper there wasn't enough supply with the increase in demand so quantity demand exceeded quantity supply, there was a shortage. And what happens in a shortage, people will bid up the prices. And what happens when you bid up prices? Prices increase. What happens when prices increase? Well, the quantity demanded of a product falls, and the quantity supplied of the product increases. That's the law of supply, law of demand. And the value of the shortage slowly decreases until you get a new equilibrium at this price, P E2, and this quantity Q E2. Now, what happens if it's the other way? Let's say there's a um, there's an increase in supply from S1 to S2. At that current price level, there's going to be an excess supply or excess quantity. So quantity supplied is going to be greater than quantity demanded because quantity supplied is going to be Q2. Quantity demanded is going to be e QE1. So when sub quantity supplied is greater than quantity demanded we call that a surplus that means you have too much of something when you have a surplus what happens is suppliers they decrease the price and what the happen what happens when price decreases quantity demanded increases quantity supply decreases you get a new equilibrium at this lower price level p2 sorry my diagrams are messy um again i'm doing this quite fast for revision purposes um function of price mechanism we the price mechanism is the ways in which the Market forces, we call it supply and demand market forces. Market forces interact in order to bring the market back to equilibrium. So we assume that in the long run, um, everything comes back to equilibrium with all these changes. And the changes we get are called the um, resource allocated functions, which are signaling incentive and another one called rationing, right? So signaling means that when you have, when you have this excess supply here, that signals to consumers and producers to alter their behavior. 
Now what happens next? There's incentive, which means that when you have this excess supply produces lower price to sell all their stock. And that creates incentive for consumers to uh, increase their quantity demanded. And at the same time, the lower price, it incentivizes uh, producers to produce a lower quantity. Um, so quantity supply decreases, quantity demanded increases. And overall, you have new equilibrium at this point. At this point, E. At this point, E2. E2 right here. And at E2, we have QE2 quantity. That means more resources overall have been allocated. Resources have been more allocated more towards producing whatever good this is. If it's shoes, it's shoes. So that's just a quick way of price mechanism. That can be asked in um, a, in a um, full part A question or part B question. Generally, it's a part A question um, on a micro uh, paper one. Next is consumer and producer surplus, and this is quite a quite a um, paper three oriented topic, and it's a lot to do with calculations, which we won't be going through this video because that would take um, a hell of a lot of time. Um, so here we have normal supply and demand, we have equilibrium. Now consumer surplus is basically the ex when you think about surplus, you think about extra, right? So consumer surplus is the extra satisfaction received by consumers who pay a lower price than what they were able and willing to pay for a product. So when you have equilibrium E1, you're gonna be at price point PE1 and you're gonna be at quantity QE1, right? Price quantity, They'll always level your axis. Now, this consumer right here who is meaning to consume this um, unit, let's say the first unit, whatever it is, of this um, shoe, of this, um, let's say we're talking about PlayStation, so of this PlayStation, they were willing to spend this much money on it. Let's say like, it's gonna be like $1,500, right? They're willing to spend that much. This next consumer may have been willing to pay $1,200. And all the way down, um, the sub, the, down the demand curve, you have all these other people who are willing to pay lower, lower prices, right? Whereas this one might be only willing to pay like, 300 bucks for a new PlayStation 5. Now, PE1 is the market price. Assuming there are no scalpers or anything like that, PE1 would be 750. As the market force of demand and supply give you 750. Now, 750 means that everyone is buying at 750, but some people like this guy, the 1500 guy, he's saving 750 because he theoretically wanted to spend $1,500. He wouldn't have minded spending $1,500 on the new console, but he ended up spending $750, so he gets a surplus. He gets a welfare bonus, right? It's this area that's his welfare bonus. If we add up for all these consumers who gain an extra bit, what we get is the shaded triangle, which is below the demand curve, above the equilibrium price. We call that the consumer surplus region. And that's going to be a triangle, and you're going to have to calculate the area of it. Consumer surplus, uh, producer surplus is to do with producers and the extra satisfaction they receive from receiving a higher price for a product than they were um, able and willing to produce for. So if uh, this supplier might right here may have been willing to produce the PlayStation 5 and sell it for 100 bucks, but and this one could be 200, this one could be 300. But the thing is, they all sell it for 750, so this one makes this much extra more, this much makes this one extra, this one extra, this one extra. Now, this whole new area of extra stuff made, so that is producer surplus. Notice how this, these guys, they don't actually produce any because they, this guy right here would have been expecting around $800 or maybe $1,000 for the new PlayStation. That's what they wanted to receive for selling a PlayStation, but of course the market price is $750, so they're not gonna, they're not gonna want to produce the extra unit. They're not gonna actually produce or sell the extra unit. Um, whereas this demander, this demander right here who wanted to pay $300, they won't get a PlayStation. So they're not, get, they're not counted in consumer and producer surplus. When you add consumer and producer surplus, we get something called community surplus or social surplus. Um, these are all to do with calculations, so do plenty of practice. Um, and competitive market equilibrium is where consumer and producer surplus is maximized. So when quantity, um, when quantity supplied equals quantity demanded, that's when it's um, maximized. So let's say if we were producing at this quantity right here, right? We get this much consumer surplus, right? We don't get this area right here because we don't produce that area. 
um, we get this much producer surplus, but notice how we've missed out on all this, all this juicy produce, uh, community surplus. So the community surplus is not maximized when we're not at equilibrium. Calculations of consumer and producer surplus from diagram, that's for HL students. SL students, I, I generally thought SL also has to do that, but it seems not. Allocated efficiency at the competitive market equilibrium. Social, some community surplus is maximized. We call that allocative efficiency, where um, the optimal resource allocation has occurred. And we consider optimal for society in terms of welfare. And welfare is equal to surplus. So that's kind of a line you have to draw. So welfare is like the well-being of society itself. And when you look at surplus, it's the additional, additional satisfaction, right? So satisfaction, we associate with well-being. So when social community surplus is maximized, we have a point where our welfare is maximized. So that's when allocated efficiency occurs. You learn more about it in theory of a firm. Marginal benefit equals marginal cost. We'll get into that later. That's all to do with externalities. Rational consumer choice. Now, this is the idea that in economics, we it's a social science, like I said in the per first video on to unit one. Social science, we study humans. We can't, we can't predict what humans do. But humans are unpredictable. But in economics, we make certain assumptions, which we call the consumer rationality assumptions, utility maximization, and perfect information assumptions. Consumer rationality is the idea that consumers, we expect them, and we predict that they behave as rational beings all the time. Utility maximization means that we assume consumers to make choices that maximize their utility. Perfect information, as the name suggests, is the assumption that um, assumption that consumers always have um, all the information they need to make a choice, which right now you can say that is not ever going to happen, right? You're never going to know everything you need to know about a decision you're going to make. And behavioral economics is the study where you consider that this is not the case, where humans actually are limited. They're not perfect people. There's going to be sometimes where these conditions or assumptions are not met, and that's the study of rational consumer choice. And this, of course, is a new um, point in the 2022 syllabus, so it's, um, it's, it's quite important to learn. Um, biases, rule of thumb, anchoring, and framing bias. So rule of thumb is sort of like a rule you go off by heart, right? It's an expression we use, a rule of thumb. And this could be, um, this is also related to anchoring, which are prices that you assume are correct for something, right? So in Australia in 2014, you could assume that one litre of milk should equal to cost one dollar, one Australian dollar. That could be an anchor price, right? When you think about an anchor, that's not always the case, but it gives you sort of like a shortcut. It's a mental shortcut you use. Whenever you see um, milk for cheaper than $1 a litre, you're like, oh, that's a good price. I'm going to get that. When in, 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 real, in reality, you're not actually considering your extra utility, etc. So you're going to have some biases that, um, biases that trip up these assumptions. The next framing is about how a choice is framed. And advertising is important because when you advertise something, it, um, the, a product, let's say a pair of shoes, it's good, the way you perceive those shoes are going to change. And that's the framing of the shoes. If you advertise something positive, positively, you're going to, um, you as a consumer are more likely to buy that thing, right? So framing has affected your um, choice, your choice. So you're not always rational. Sometimes maybe that extra pair of shoes um, that those Nike Air Jordans may cost you $500 and that may not actually maximize your utility, but you go on impulse and you actually buy it because is framed in such a way that says, oh, this shoe is going to be um, going up in price in the future and like to $5,000 and you think, okay, I'm going to get it now. Availability is the idea that some things are available while others are not. And this could even be, um, uh, this could be an example would be like, if you know that, uh, let's say you like Heinz beans and um, those are the beans that maximize your utility and they're the same price as for some home, br home brand beans. Let's say the Heinz beans are all sold out. Well, they're not available anymore, so you have to buy their own brand um, beans. Boundary rationality is the idea that consumers are not always rational. So, again, you some people make impulse buys. This is very common in online shopping. And because of that, we assume that consumers don't always act rationally. They don't think through their choices. Boundary self-control, this links to how... Um, consumers consider their maximum utility and they don't make choices that harm them. So like if you um, are looking at Tim Tams, right, you know you, you know that extra Tim Tams is bad for you, but you may not have enough self-control to stop yourself from eating that extra Tim Tams. So you consume an additional unit 
while knowing that it doesn't maximize your utility and it's irrational to do so. Bounded selfishness is very interesting. So when we um, when we look at consumers in economics, we assume they're heartless, um, heartless, selfish monsters, right? They only care about their own well-being. But you know that in reality, humans aren't humans aren't always selfish. They are selfless. Like donating to charity would not be considered a rational choice because it doesn't maximize your literal utility. I guess you get some altruistic notion notions from donating charity, but um, like I said, people do donate, donate to charity, so they're not always selfish. So this assumption falls out the window. Imperfect information is the most obvious one. Humans are not always going to know everything about a product. So if you have some cup noodles, they could have some weird ingredients in there. But you read the back of the packet, you can get information. But that's most likely not all the information contained um, that helps a consumer make a choice. So. So with that, you're going to have some decisions where you make without having all the information. So this is not going to be this perfect information assumption completely falls out the window. So when you look at these assumptions, assessment objective three, you might get a paper one, um, part A, where you have to explain some of these, um, explain like biases or imperfect information and consumer theory. That's what assessment objective three is all about. And you can, of course, get paper um, three questions, like slow, small questions about these, and you should be able to answer the uh, answer based on um, explanations of these factors. And to do that, you need to be comfortable. I really like this consumer rationality because it is quite applicable in the real world. There's not much memorizing to do. If you just look at your own life, you can tell that these things apply um, apply to them. Behavioral economics in action. So this is where behavioral economics is implemented in your real life. We have something called choice architecture, which is how a choice is framed. So the default choice, restricted and mandated choice, these are quite cool to think about in terms of surveys. If you have a survey option already filled out for you, um, that's a default choice. If a survey option restricts a certain answer, that's a restricted choice and mandated choices are choices that are required for you to follow through. So a default choice could be that so there was an interesting study about organ donors. So there was um, there was a there was one survey which was like, if you want to be an organ donor, please click yes. And then what what that and then the other other second survey was like, if you don't want to be an organ donor, please press no. And what they found was there were more people willing to be an organ donor on the second one because they were more likely to follow through the default choice of them being organ donors, right? And restricted choices where some options aren't available for you. And mandated choice is where you have to do something. So maybe if you want to join a club, you have to have a mandated choice of paying a certain membership fee. That's a mandated choice. So behavioral economics is suddenly exploited by um, by profit-seeking industries that may want to uh, make you behave in a certain way. Nudge theory is the idea that you give consumers the ability to make a choice, but you flame you frame the choice in such a way that consumers make the choice you want. So if you think about smoking, right, you have those um, pictures of all the diseases and all the consequences um, of smoking, like you have someone with their teeth really messed up after smoking a lot. That's called a consumer nudge where you see that and you think, okay, that might be me in the future if I continue smoking and you're less likely to do that. So you you are not mandated or you're not restricted the choice of smoking, but you are less likely to smoke if you see that picture. Right, that's how nudge theory works. It's slightly nudging you, and we're going to be looking at looking at nudge theory more when we talk about uh, attempts to solve market failure. Business objectives: we have profit maximization. Now, profit maximization is the idea that um, consumers and private industries, I guess, private firms, um, aim to produce in such a way that their profits are maximized. And that uh, profit maximization occurs where MR or marginal revenue equals marginal cost. We're going to look at that later, but that's something you need to remember as a rule in economics. So I'm writing that down for you guys to memorize. Alternative business objectives are the idea that sometimes profits are not the only things sought out by um, firms. So sometimes there's corporate social responsibility where um, firms produce a product that's actually useful for society. So this could be like um, this could be like milk. Okay, milk. Lots of people drink milk, so so they might consider that a corporate social responsibility give cheaper milk to certain people so they won't increase price but that much market share is how much of the market is operated by a single product or a single single firm so if you look at the australian supermarket industry you have coles and woolies which are 
the two large parts, right? They have large market share. And sometimes market share can be increased by um, by producing a whole heap of output without considering profits, right? So if you produce a where you might actually not be maximizing profits, but you produce so many more. So maybe you produce 100 pairs of shoes, you might be maximizing profits. But if you produce 200 pairs of shoes, you may not be maximizing profits, but still you're making um, a greater impact on market share. And market share is important because it enables firms to gain a greater, greater control of their market, right? So if you own a greater proportion of the shoe market, you can change price and you'll basically have more customers to appeal to, which is helpful in the long run. Satisfying is when firms undercut their profits in order to lower price and outcompete certain firms. So if you have like Coles and Woolies, they may they may get they may try to compete with each other and Coles may cut their price of bread um to to um to gain a lot of um consumers of bread to switch from woolies to coals if you get what i mean i'll go into this example more in um oligopolies but um so they lower price that's going to lower their lower their profit but what happens is they gain a market share of Woolworths they're trying to outcompete Woolworths growth is the idea that um they just want to grow so business grows when it has more output like i said earlier mi equals mc is the um, profit maximizing level but um firms could be producing beyond that in order to maximize growth instead of um instead of profits next we have the concept of elasticity which is the responsiveness of one thing to another so diagram of elasticity and elastic demand we'll look at that soon uh, price elasticity of demand i would define as a measure of the responsiveness of quantity demanded of a product to a given change in the same product's price so what that means is of course the law of demand states that when price increases quantity demand decreases but if there's a dollar increase in the price of cigarettes there might be a smaller fall in um quantity demanded than if there's a dollar price increase in a boost chocolate bar right um there are several factors that affect it but here's the calculation percentage change in quantity demand and percentage change in price you're going to need to remember that because paper threes will almost always have elasticity diagram ped perfectly elastic perfect okay so let's draw some diagrams for ped now I can draw a better diagram Let's draw the, just the demand curve here. Let's say we go from price P1 to P2, right? P1 to P2. Here we have a normal demand curve that's got sort of like a normal slope. But what if we had something like this with a very flat slope? We call that an inelastic demand curve. When you have inelastic demand, that means that uh, quantity demanded is relatively irresponsive to price changes. So if something's a necessity or something's addictive, or we'll go into that later, but if uh, the price of the product changes, you won't actually demand much more of it. So quantity demand won't change by much. So here, since this is quite steep, you can already see visually that when price decreases from P1 to P2, quantity demanded only increases from this to this, right? It's not that much. Whereas... If you have a demand curve like this, a very flat curve, very um, very flat curve, this is called elastic demand, where there is high responsiveness to price changes. So if price changes from P1 to P2, you actually have quantity demand increasing from this all the way to somewhere here, right? It's off the charts, literally. We have uh, quantity demand increasing by a greater proportion than the price change. Now, proportions are always relative for quantity demanded to price. Right, so if price changes, if there's a price change and quantity demanded changes by a greater proportion, that's elastic. If um, PED is um, there and then um, quantity demanded changes by a lower proportion than the change in price, that is going to be inelastic. So the demand curves we looked at earlier, we had um, inelastic, which is the super steep one, and elastic, which is a super flat one. Or well, you can have extremes of both. You can have a straight up vertical. One which we call um, perfectly inelastic because price changes, a proportion of price change leads to no change at all in the quantity demanded. It's just flat completely. This is just assume this is a vertical line, a fully vertical line. And the other one we have is um, perfectly elastic supply, where even a proportion of price change leads to an infinitely, infinitely large quantity demanded change, such that you can't change price at all. Right, PED, degrees of PED, the theoretical range 
PED is always going to be negative because if you have a change in price, quantity demand is going to go the opposite way. For example, price increase, QD decreases, so PED is always negative, but we sort of emit the negative in economics. So if PED is greater than zero and less than one, technically it's greater than less than zero and greater than negative one, but um, we assume PED is positive, so we just take the positive value. Um, this is called inelastic because as you can see here, the numerator is going to be smaller than the denominator, which means it's relatively irresponsive. Oops. Um, degrees of PED, you have those. Um, and the other one is this, PED is greater than 1. So PED is greater than 1. That's relatively elastic because the numerator is greater than the denominator. I'm not going to explain that again. And the extremes of PED is unit elastic. Um, PED is um, perfectly inelastic means PED equals zero. Um, PED is infinity means perfectly elastic. And there's also something called unit elastic, which is where PED is basically the same throughout, but I'm not going to be going through that, that video, this video. But it's the idea that a proportionate price change leads to an equally proportionate change in uh, quantity demanded. So the numerator and the denominator are equal, PED equals one. And price changes along the demand curve. Um, PED changes along the demand curve, and we're going to look at that through the determinants of PED. So determinants of PED are the number of closeness of substitutes, degree of necessity, proportion of income, and um, yeah, I'm not going to highlight this bit, just this. Those are the determinants. We're going to look at the determinants before we go on to why um, before we go on to why PED varies along the down sloping demand curve. So if you have lots of substitutes for a product, let's say like pairs of shoes, generally there are lots of shoes in the shoe industry. There are unbranded shoes. There are like many smaller brands. There's like Nike, Adidas, Asics, New Balance, and large ones as well. Um, you could see, you could say that there are lots of close substitutes for a pair of I don't know some brand of shoes, some running shoes from Nike. You have many substitutes for that, right? If you have a lot of substitutes, PED is quite elastic because if price changes, there's going to be a large change in the quantity demanded. Let's say price of Nike shoes increases. Well, substitute markets are going to have consumers go from their markets to the Nike market, increasing quantity demanded, and because we have more clothes. Um, substitutes, quantity demand is going to increase greater than proportionally, making it elastic. On the other hand, a fall in price of Nike, um, a rise in price of Nike shoes means that um, there are lots of substitutes in this case where firms can, uh, where consumers can switch to, so quantity demand is going to uh, fall greater than proportionally, right? That's why, um, that's why um, you don't have much variation in the quantity in like shoes in the market for shoes. Degree of necessity is how how much you need something to live. So let's say uh, before we do that, actually in the other circumstance where number and closeness substitutes is quite low, so you have very few substitutes. There's going to be less people moving between these um, substitute markets, so there's going to be low elasticity. There's going to be relatively inelastic PED. Degree of necessity is to do with how um, much some things need to live. So if you have like food and rice, that could be a necessity, bread necessity, whereas maybe like um, a a Samsung or, or Apple Watch maybe um, maybe not be a necessity. You don't need it to live. So that could um, something that's not a necessity. If there's a price change, quantity demand will fall by a greater amount. Whereas if you have something that's a necessity, if there's a price change, there'll be a lower proportion and um, change in quantity demanded. Because if bread increases, people can't just stop uh, buying bread. They still need it to live. Whereas if um, a smartwatch changes in price, people don't need it to live, so that's more likely to be change. And the other one, the proportion of income, change of income spent on the good. So that is, if you have a more expensive thing, um, expensive item, uh, greater per uh, percentage change. Since we're looking at percentages, a percentage change, let's say, of ten percent of a thousand dollar product, that's going to be a hundred dollar change, versus ten percent change of a one dollar product, which is going to be ten cents. Notice how the notice how the thousand dollar product is greater. Well, because the percentage um, uh, change is greater, there's actually going to be a greater felt. Uh, you're going to feel a greater percentage change in quantity demanded, right? If something's hundred dollars more expensive, people are going to decrease quantity demand by greater amount than if it's ten cents more expensive. This is the thing with cars versus lollipops. If a lollipop increases in price by ten percent, that's going to be a smaller fall in quantity demanded than if a car increases in price by ten percent. 
because the absolute increase is going to be larger. And time is also a key factor. If you're in the rain and you want an umbrella, if it costs you $10 versus $20, you're not going to care because you, you, need, you need it. You can't get wet in the rain. So time, if there's a short time period, then things are things in general are relatively inelastic because you need it now. And you can't change your behavior. You need it now. Whereas if you have a long time to make a choice, then some things are relatively elastic because you can alter your choices. You don't need to make it exactly now. right? You don't, you, you're not uh, stuck for choice. Now, why does PED vary along the demand curve? Well, let's go back up to this. Uh, look, actually, no, let's, let's make a new demand curve, actually. So, demand curve, downward sloping. So, up here, let's say there's point A, right? And we go to point B, and then we have point C and point D. Right, if we go from point A to point B, at point A, right, so let's say from point A to point B, the same fall in price, right? Same amount fall in price as there from C to D, right? price falls by the same amount just ignore ignore these price values and let's say price falls by ten dollars price falls by ten dollars right uh actually ten percent ten percent that's what i meant so if price falls by ten percent price falls by ten percent so here when where a is clearly higher price than c right so like we said about how high proportion of income spent on the good if a falls in price by ten percent that's going to be let's say a is a, like a is like $30,000, $30, right? A 10% fall is $3,000 decrease. That's going to be more felt by consumers. So quantity demand is going to be increasing by a greater proportion, right? Than when, when C decreases by 10%. Oops. When C decreases by 10%, right? Because when C decreases by 10%, if C is like $100, that's going to go down to $90. So the price fall is not going to be as great, right? And similarly, the quantity demanded increase is not going to be as large. That's why if you have a higher, if you have a product, right, on the demand, demand curve, when it's higher, in the higher price range, you're going to have elastic demand and the lower price range, you're going to have inelastic demand. And somewhere in the middle, when you switch from PED greater than one to PED to PED greater than zero, less than one, you're going to have a point where PED equals zero, and at that point is unilastic. So again, these topics, um, I'm going fast because of revision, but um, this, this topic is very important, and it generally does deserve another video on its own. So if you do want to see that, leave a comment down below, because my explanation is quite fast, and if you don't have any prior knowledge at all, then um, it would be difficult to understand. Next up, PED and total revenue. So this is the idea that PED is important for businesses to consider when they take into account total revenue of something, a product. So total revenue is um, equal to price times quantity. So if you have an inelastic product and you increase price, there's going to be less than proportional fall in quantity. So this whole value for total revenue would go up. Right. If you have an inelastic, if you have an elastic product and you increase price, you're going to have a greater than proportional decrease in quantity demanded. TR goes down. If you have an inelastic product and you in decrease price, you're going to have a fall in price, but a less than proportional increase in, like a tiny increase in quantity demanded. And what that happens is TR overall decreases. If you have an elastic product and you increase, if you decrease price, you're going to have a greater than proportional increase in quantity. Total revenue is going to go up. So businesses consider um, consider price changes when they, I mean, consider uh, PED when they make price changes. Because think about it. If you know that someone, if if you know that. A consumers are relatively inelastic to your product and you want to maximize profits you might increase price because you know they're not going to produce they're not going to consume far less they're going to consume the same amount this is the same with oil how oil prices rise and people consume the same amount because we need oil to live and will drive our cars now we have to look at a diagram so if we have let's do a diagram here All right p and then q let's draw an inelastic demand curve so let's say that Let's call this 
P1 and this P2. So we have fall in price from P, P1 to P2. So at P1, the, there would have been Q1 demand and there's Q2 demand, quantity demanded at um, P2. Right, so P1 times Q1 is the revenue here. We'll call this area A, we'll call this area B, we'll call this area C. So this rec these rectangles, right? So at price P1, the quantity demand is Q1 and the total revenue is A plus B, this whole square. Um, at price P2, the total revenue is A plus C because P2 times Q2 is the total area of revenue. All right? Notice how with the inelastic, we have a we have this this area lost from B. This area B, we lose that area when we lower price, but we gain this area C. And it's clear that area B is larger than area C, so our total revenue or that the size of our triangle. I mean rectangle which represents total revenue actually falls so that's why total revenue falls when you lower price in an inelastic demand curve but if you increase price you're going to be losing out area c but you're going to be gaining b which means you're going to gain um gain revenue overall total revenue is going to be a plus b rather than a plus c which is a total increase and for the next one for the elastic curve i want you guys to draw out the elastic curve and do the same thing and write down some statements like this and say what happens when you increase price and when you decrease price. And pause the video, have a go, come back. So assuming you guys did the video, did the um, challenge, if you increase price to an elastic um, demand curve, what happens is you you lose, lose total revenue. If you decrease price, you gain total revenue. Importance of PD for firms and government decision making. We looked at why it's important for firms. If they maximize revenue, they're more likely to maximize profits. Um, governments, um, the idea is like if they take on a tax, right? A tax increases the price of a product, but if that proportionate increase in price does not lead to a, that much of a decrease in quantity demanded, then it's not effective. Um, if they are purely trying to generate revenue, then it is. Um, effective. So if the government wants to generate revenue from a tax, they tax an inelastic thing because when they in, when it's inelastic, quantity demand is not going to fall by much, even though price increases by a lot, and they gain a lot of government government revenue. But if they're thinking of cigarettes and taxing them, well, cigarettes are very addictive, so they're going to be inelastic in demand, and because of their inelasticity, price may increase by ten dollars, but people may not uh, their quantity demand may not decrease by all that much. You can think of elastic, inelastic examples and think about what happens when governments tax them. Next up is the idea that PD for primary commodities is lower than PD for manufactured products. This is all about um, this is all about number of substitutes available. If you think about primary commodities, they're basically like land resources like rice, vegetables, agricultural products. They generally don't have many substitutes. Like you can't find a proper substitute for carrots or rice. So compared to a manufactured good, which is like a um, like a certain type of toy where you can have many substitutes for that, right? So because of this, primary commodities are generally inelastic compared to manufactured products. And we're going to be assessing that a lot more in um, certain topics such as international economics. Calculation, PED, change in price, quantity demanded, or total revenue from data provided. That's just looking at the TR equals P times Q and calculating changes in TR from P and Q changes. Income elasticity of demand is a measure of responsiveness of change in quantity demanded to a change in income. Remember we said that um, change in income is an on-price determinant where um, increase in income, increase in demand, decrease in income, decrease in demand. Here we say quantity demanded for some reason and here we have a diagram showing elastic um, income in elastic and inferior goods on the angle curve. We'll get into that soon. But this whole idea is that certain products, if they're um, if they're luxury products, then as the price, as the income of consumers increase, the quantity demanded increases greater than proportionally. If they are no, if they are normal goods, then um, there's as income increases, percentage change in quantity demanded increases. Um, less than proportionally so let me draw these out as inequalities and in yed um, the value itself is very important so if yed is positive that means something different from yed is negative so we actually consider the sign so if yed is greater than one we call that luxury good 
and a luxury good greater than proportional increase in quantity demanded. If YED is less than uh, 1 and greater than 0, we call that a normal good. As price increases, the uh, as income increases, quantity demanded increases greater than proportional less than proportionally but still does increase but when yed equal is less than zero we call that an inferior good because as income increases demand quantity demanded for the product decreases and now you might be wondering why on earth is this happening when we said income increase quantity uh, in demand is meant to increase as well or as income decreases demands meant to decrease how does this work when i obviously said something else previously in the non-price determinant demand well, there are two types of goods. There are inferior goods and normal goods. Inferior goods are goods that are bought when income is lower. So as income increases, you have a fall in the demand for inferior goods. So quantity demanded, um, percentage change in quantity demanded will have an opposite sign to change percentage change in income. So PYED is going to be negative, right? That's why it's an inferior good. Normal goods and luxury goods, they are positive. And normal goods tend to differ from luxury good in the idea that normal goods are necessities, so they're relatively inelastic. There's not going to be that much of a change. Now, if you think about inferior good, inferior goods could be like home brand products. As income increases, generally there's a fall in demand for home brand products. You might buy branded products, uh, non-home brand products. Income elastic demand, so it can be for services as well. Luxuries and services tend to intermingle. They call them the tertiary sector. Um, the angle curve is a curve that looks like this. So on the y-axis you have income, the independent variable, and then you have quantity demanded, which is the dependent variable. And here you're going to have a curve like this, which is the inferior part. This, which is the, um, which is the, um, sorry, this is the luxury part. This is the normal part. This is the inferior part where it's relatively elastic or you can have a backwards bit right so what this idea is saying is that as incomes so this is looking at one single product like let's say a hundred dollar pair of shoes when income of an of a person increases right at first maybe the first initial increase from here when income is low you go from maybe 5k um a year for 10k a year at first, that $100 pair of shoes is a luxury for you, right? Because that's very unaffordable at that very low level of income. So what happens is, because it's a luxury, we have YED greater than 1. There's a greater than proportional increase in quantity demanded with a proportional change in income. But as you get to a certain point of income, that product, that the $100 pair of shoes, when you earn like 40K, you know, 40K a year, that becomes a normal good, right? It becomes like a necessity. You have to have the $100 pair of shoes, otherwise you can't go on a run. And um, what happens is you're going to have a le you're going to have a less than proportional increase in quantity demanded when you have a percentage increase in income, right? You still have the increase um, increase. So when income increases, quantity demanded increases, but it's less than proportional, right? That's why it's a bit more steep here. Right, it's less flat, it's a bit more steep in this middle section. Next up, we have the, so in this middle section where it's um, less steep but still uh, positive, you have YED greater than zero, less than one, which is a normal good. However, if income increases even further, let's say you're earning 40K a year. If you're earning 40K, not 40K, sorry, 400K a year, then those shoes may not be um, that, that good for you. Those $100 shoes, you may need like $2,000 shoes. So, these become an inferior good, right? These these are considered an inferior good when your income increases at that level. So proportionate change in income leads to a opposite proportionate change in quantity demanded. That is, if income increases by proportionate amount, quantity demanded decreases. So YED is negative. That's why this angle curve looks like this. And so that's how the angle curve is shaped. And you've got to be able to explain how that why the shape is the case and that's assessment objective two and four assessment objective four meaning you can get a part a or part b in a paper one yed calculations we're not going to be going over that just use the formula substituted in importance of yed for firms is that generally when economic fluctuations occur we'll look at this more in macro but when fluctuations occur, income levels of households in the economy are likely to change so firms can switch from producing um, inferior goods to um, um, to other types of goods like um, 
manufactured goods uh, or normal goods luxuries they can change those based on income changes or that are predicted income changes so that in order for them to maximize their revenue right so if there's a percentage change in income and firms produce like let's say there's an increase in income in the economy due to economic growth if a firm is producing an inferior good they would realize that in order for them to sell the most and maximize revenue the inferior good production is bad so they must switch production to a luxury good and that might be beneficial because as incomes rise there's going to be greater than proportional increase in quantity demand for the luxury leading to an increase in total revenue for the firm now the other ones is the sector of the economy remember how i said there's the primary secondary tertiary structure sector sectors of the economy primary tends to be inferior secondary tends to be or manufacturing tends to be um, a normal um, good type of industry type of um, sector and the tertiary or service sector is generally a luxury sector so what happens is as um, economies grow incomes also increase and as incomes increase you have greater than you have a decrease in the you have a decrease in the actual um, inferior good uh, sector or the primary sector primary sector is going to fall because why it is negative for that why it is normal for the manufacturing sector that's going to grow why it is greater than um greater than proportional for the tertiary or service sector because it's luxury so the service sector is going to go even further so as as growth continues the tertiary sector improves the most or increases or grows the most so the manufacturing sector the second most and the primary sector tends to fall and the opposite is the case for a fall in income Try and do a fall in income by yourself and consider the changes that occur. That's price um, elasticity and of demand and um, price elastic why price income elasticity of demand. So those two are to do with demand. Those changes are quite important for policy making, as you can see, and also evaluating how economies change over time. Next up, the last bit on elasticity is price elasticity of supply, which again is proportionate change in percentage change in quantity supplied with the percentage change in price according to the law of demand they both law of supply they both change the same direction price increase qs increase so ped is always going to be positive determinants of pes um, well you have perfectly elastic perfectly inelastic and relatively elastic inelastic um, we're going to draw some soon and of course these ones as well and pes does vary along the same curve um, PES does vary along the same curve, and the determinants of PES are time, mobility, factors of production, unused capacity, ability to store, rate at which costs increase. So, if you consider time, if there's more time available, there's going to be a greater ability for producers to change quantity supplied with given change in price, right? So, if price increases, um, and immediately you're not going to see uh, firms producing less right there's going to be a delay so in a short period of time um, pes is going to be relatively irresponsive relatively inelastic supply whereas if you have long time it'll be more elastic mobility of factors of production means how easily can um, factors of production used to produce one good be switched to another good so let's say price of, of good a increases then quantity supplied would increase in good a but if factors of production are non mobile then you can't switch uh, factors of production from being employed in other factors other goods like good a b c d e f right we can't switch um, those factors of production as easily to producing a so pes would be relatively inelastic as quantity supplied cannot be increased by as large of a proportion as the percentage um, increase in price so low mobility of factors of production inelastic uh, high mobility elastic unused capacity if there's lots of capacity then you can increase production uh, or change production by a greater amount and also the ability to store think about a warehouse right if you have a large warehouse and you can store a lot you can change um very easily this is why lots of large companies have lots of stock in warehouses so that they can change and be more responsive so the higher these you these are the greater the um elasticity rate at which costs increase well think about it if costs increase by a greater amount right so the rate at which costs increase is higher then firms are going to be less able and willing to change increase quantity supply if price changes right so a dollar change in price if it if there's a ten dollar increase in cost versus a dollar increase in cost well the dollar increase in cost may lead to an increase in quantity supply but the ten dollar one may not 
right? So if there's higher rate of cost increase, there's going to be a lower PES, whereas a lower rate of cost increase, a higher PES. Now we look at PES, let's draw some diagrams. I'm going a bit fast now because you guys sort of get used to the idea of elasticity. PQS, you have um, relatively elastic supply, relatively inelastic supply, perfectly inelastic supply. This could be like game tickets for a stadium because you can't have more seats. Um, perfectly elastic supply. Right, those are the four main types. Um, and PES is less than one for um, per, for inelastic. PES is greater than one for elastic. PED equals zero for inelastic. PES e equals infinity for um, perfectly elastic. PES for primary commodities is generally lower than PES for manufactured manufactured goods because generally primary commodities take a long time to produce. So you can think of agricultural products. There's a long time delay. So if time is taken. Uh, for production, so uh, I actually forgot to mention this. Time cannot be, time does not necessarily mean the time after a production change. It could be time taken to produce a good. Right? If it takes a long time to produce a good, you can't change quantity supplied as quickly, right? You can't either decrease quantity supplied or increase quantity supplied rapidly. Say if wheat prices change as a wheat farmer, you can't change your supply that quantity supplied that easily. Whereas if you are a supplier of fidget spinners, you can easily, they don't take that long to make, right? You, um, you can easily, you can relatively easily change quantity supplied. So PES is going to be relatively elastic for manufactured, relatively inelastic for commodities. Yep, and calculating PES, that's just substituting in the values provided. Make sure that PES, it's going to be a positive value. So if you get a negative value, you've done something wrong. And... Yeah, that's going to be elasticity, all of elasticity. Next up, we're going to have to cover um, market failure, which um, now that I think about it, since it's an hour and 10, I probably won't be able to cover all of micro. I might have bitten off more than I could chew here. I might not be able to cover all of micro in this video alone. Like um, looking here might take me um, one more video to make. Yeah, one more video on micro, but um, this might be where I have to wrap it up for video one. Honestly, was expecting to be able to do all of micro in this one video, but as I am explaining um, things in some detail, I have to take a lot of time to explain all this stuff, and it's going to be hard to explain the uh, rest of micro because the rest of micro is sort of like the hard part of micro, and it's going to be like a three, four hour video. I don't want to bore you guys with that. So I'm going to be cutting it at this video. If you guys do find this, um, did find this video helpful, don't forget to smash that like button. Like I said, five likes is the goal for this video. And of course, um, if you guys did uh, find some of my under, some of my explanations a bit difficult, please leave that in the comment. If it's a hate comment, I don't mind. <laughs> I can uh, make a new video on it with um, a better explanation. And other than that, see you guys in a future video. Peace out.